They're guys. They do magic. Magic! They are the magic guys. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 153 of the Magic Guys. Coming in at 93 kilos. To my left is Nick K. And anorexic 93, (laughs) Nick K. Yeah. And to his right, (laughs) coming in at 91 kilos is Josh Norbido. Round one, fight. Did I get, was I accurate? I don't know how much you weigh. Dude, uh, no, I am a little bit more than 94 kilos. True. Because I, I, am, I am 91. So okay, I, was, I was just basing it off like our shaved heads. I'm like that, you know. Yeah. It's probably I'm, similar. I am 100 kilos, which I think in badges, which is the way we measure all things on this podcast due to that. Yes. Do Scala, uh, I mean, oh, how many elephants? Uh, I think a baby elephant is 205 kilos. I looked it up a little yeah. while ago. Don't ask me why. Um, I think I'm like one leg of an elephant is what that yeah. is. That's but that's saying. like 90, 91 is like 100, what, 185 pounds, something like that. Okay. Well, I'm down from 105 proudly. And um, yeah, so I'm on a big health regime. And my goal is to look nice. more and more like Josh Nabito. Because if you remove your hat, Josh, for the guys who are watching live on the YouTube right now... <laughs> We're the same person. We are the same. I'm Melbourne. He's Melbourne, Josh Nobito, and I'm Brisbane, Nick K. That's what that, that is. That is so weird. I bet you we could do that. I, yeah. This would be so funny. Let's book a gig. <laughs> yes. Hear me out. Where we do each I'm other's gonna, gigs. Yeah, and you just rock up like, hi, I'm Nick K. And then you can like, and then it'll be, actually, hi, I'm Josh Nobito. Actually, that would be a massive lifesaver. If I get double booked... Like yeah. I could book myself out for two gig, twice as many gigs now because they don't really know what I sound like. They just see, you know, the promo and stuff. They don't we do... really know what I sound like. See yeah. how, how good I am. Wow, so that me... was. Look, wow. friends. You know, I used to, I used to play in a band, and like my good friend, everyone, <laughs> I, I can be Nick K. <laughs> uh, you gotta and do we have around the party and call everyone brother man. What's up, brother man? And give him a high five. That's that's where we're at yeah, now, friends. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, Doug, yeah. Ke- Doug, Doug, Daddy Doug is away. He might be in the North Pole. We're not sure, but uh, there is um, the weather is going crazy. We've had some floods on our side of the planet. There's some floods mm. on his side of the planet, and he has to deal with a couple of uh, issues on that side of the planet. So we wish him well. He said he will keep us updated to make sure everything's okay. But he told us. To tell you guys, he's sorry he can't make it, but he does send his love to everyone who is here. And speaking of everyone who's here, let's have a quick look in the chat. We have Johnny Prentice, we have Scotty P, Scott Smith, uh, Tim Askin, all them questions. And who else is here? Jeff, that's a new face. Welcome to the party, pal. And again, thank you guys for being here. Welcome to what I hope is the first of very many history lessons. And as per your feedback and request, we're going to start our very first lesson with an amazing man. Are we ready to tell? Are we ready for story time? I think we're ready. Do you want to lead us in? So basically, the way today will go is Nick is going to dive into this amazing research he's done. And I'm going to give you live commentary as someone who's learning about this at the same time. And you guys put your questions in for follow ups or thoughts or feedback. Absolutely. Now I'm going to be reading from a script for the majority. So if I don't see your comments, just kindly interrupt um, uh, Josh, because I, uh, I'm going to do my very best to read this as best I can. Uh, everything that I'd scripted out and did my research on keeping in mind and, that. Yep. Go on. And uh, Pasha just mentioned as well. Don't forget about us Facebook watchers. Well, we appreciate the one of you that do watch fire Facebook. So <laughs> thank you for being here, Pasha. We love you. Thank you, Pasha. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, Gary Davis. Winner of the competition last time with the bill change. Bless your heart. Here we go. Born 7th of December, 1805, was a French watchmaker, magician, and illusionist. This man took magic from a pastime for the lower classes and performed it. Which, Well, let me rephrase that. For those of you that don't know, prior to this gentleman... Most magicians were dressed up like wizards and kind of douchey. They used to perform at fairs and so forth. And it was this gentleman... He took that entertainment to the wealthy and performing in his very own theater in Paris. 
This man led a legacy that was so vast that he's now been dubbed the father of modern magic. And that man's name was Jean Eugene Robert Houdin. Let's begin. Robert Houdin was born Jean or Jean, Jean Eugene Robert. He was born in a place in France called Blois, which I had to look up because it's spelled B L O I S, not Blaus. It's actually pronounced Blois. Now, his father, his father's name was Prosper, who was a watchmaker in Blau, Blois. And, you, and his mother, unfortunately, died when he was a young child. Now, at the age of 11, his father sent uh, Ribéhédan to a school that was 35 miles up in um, a place called Loire, which is the University of Orleans. At 18, he graduated and then returned back to Blois. His father wanted him to be a lawyer, but Robert Houdin wanted to follow his father's footsteps and be a watchmaker. And this is kind of pertinent in his story. Now, as far as his skill set, his penmanship was excellent, and it landed him a job as a clerk at, a, at an attorney office. Now, instead of studying law, he tinkered with mechanical gadgets as he had this proclivity to play with things of that nature because his father being a clockmaker and working on large style clocks and watches, etc. And this is going to be very important later in the story. Now his employer actually said to him, like, he's no good and sent him back to his father. And he was told he was better suited as a watchmaker. But by then, John's father had actually retired. And so he then became an apprentice to his cousin who had a watch shop. And so for a short term, Jean Eugene was actually a watchmaker. That's very interesting. Isn't it just? <laughs> now, back in you the... Know, 18- when, when, yeah. when you said that line, like his parents wanted him to be a lawyer, but someone insisted, I, I swear to God, you were going to say magician. And I was like, that's where that joke was born. Right. Now, my parents now, wanted me to be a doctor, but... Oh, no, what's the joke? I wanted to be a doctor, but my parents insisted I'd be a magician. Yeah. You know? um, Sean Farquhar says that about his daughters. He goes like, oh, look, when she grows up, she can be any type of magician she wants to be. And I think that's yeah, a little yeah, bit adorable, yeah, Sean yeah, Farquhar. Yeah. That's a little bit adorable. But here's where he first found his love for magic. In the mid-1820s, he saved up enough money because he wanted to buy some books on clockmaking. However, when he received these books in this package, right, he got home cracked open these books and it was a two volume set on magic called scientific amusements right now instead of returning the books curiosity got the best of him and he decided to actually read these books which then sparked his love for magic and he read these and practiced this on for like hours on end i in fact did a little google search on this book and it's now public domain i have a link for it if you guys want it can i just post that in the chat after the after the episode and people can go scope it out josh i think so yeah and cool. if you send it to me we can put it in the description of the video as amazing well. i'll cut and paste um, that a little bit afterwards if, that sounds if great if we had talked about it we probably could have you know popped up a, a photo of it but you know that's okay yeah yeah but we're just like imagine- Manitella, you and i we can't stand each other unless we're performing together <laughs> that's right that's why we're mm-hmm. so close we do this podcast cities apart <laughs> yeah, that's the only way we can get along. Okay, now from this point onward, he became very interested in the art forms he's getting these books, right? Uh, but he was upset about the books only revealed how the secret was done, but not show how to do them. And he found that learning from books that were available at that time were very difficult due to the lack of explanations. So he then started taking lessons from a local magician. He paid this local magician 10 francs, uh, to a man called, and I'm going to do my best to pronounce this, it's Maos, and he was from Blau, Blua. He was from Blua. Uh, he was actually a podiatrist who also entertained at fairs, doing parties, etc. Now, when, as he was learning from this guy, basically this, this particular gentleman was proficient in sleight of hand. He taught Robert how to juggle and improve his hand-eye coordination, right? He also taught him like, the rudiments with like cups and balls and, um, through this, this is where Robert Houdin started to increase his dexterity and so forth, right? And he just practiced and practiced incessantly. Mind you, at this point, it's only a side hustle. So for those of you who are sitting on the fence, being like, this is chill, you're all just like Robert Houdin. So keep rolling with it, right? Mm. So 
as an amateur magician or as a, someone, a lover of magic, who was just a little side hustle. He performed at social parties and, and, but eventually started like performing professionally in Europe and across the United States. It was during this period that he met his lovely wife. Wait, just casually performing in Europe and the United States is must be so hectic back then because you got to travel by ship to get to like America from yeah and from France that is no easy feat to get there like that is that is of course unless the world is flat no one kidding that's, that's not too bad <laughs> that's <true>. you could... <laughs> <laughs> no you would just go across the North Atlantic Ocean which would probably take about two to three months and you would land on the east coast of the states pretty comfortably so that's that's pretty insane. And also, can I just mention, like, how crazy is it? Uh, like, how does that watch company person feel? Like, does he know that he changed the course of magic by fucking up the order for for Robert Houdin? Like, instead of putting in the watch books, accidentally put in these magic books. Does he have yeah. any idea? Like, is there a magician out there that's actually now changed the world for watchmaking? Because yeah, he got could, the wrong order. Yeah, you, <laughs> he got Robert you, Houdin's order. Yeah, could you imagine that? Like, I ordered some some soccer boots or something, you know. But instead, ballet shoes rocked up, and now I'm the next Fred Astaire, like part of the ballet company and so forth. Like, could you imagine that was a thing? I think. I would. I mean, look, people want to see that. I mean, you know. Maybe there is an episode where Nick Kay is a ballerina man uh -huh. and that could be very interesting. In another galaxy, for sure. That's definitely a thing. Another now, <laughs> now, he met his wife, who was the daughter of a um, Parisian watchmaker. And um, they. He, he says that he fell in love with her at first sight, which I think is adorable. And on the 8th of July... 1830 they were married okay now here's where it's interesting because he then hyphenated his name to match hers so instead of being eugene robert he changed his name to robert houdin because her name was wow. um yeah her name was um joseph or yourself i imagine yourself cecile houdin her that was her name that was her name so he, took, he, her name he took her name on her name which I think is kind of sweet. What's going on here? Right? This dude's, this dude's sits at home making watches, takes other girls' names, travels on ships for months. This is a yeah. classic magician in Ab the making. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now, so with his lovely wife, he had, he had eight children. Three survived. Oh. This is pretty common. This is common practice in the 1800s. Get used to that. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, very common. It's like, it's I got a splinter. Like the, um, it's kind of like the baby totals on that island where they're like, you see them all hatch and there's like millions of them running to the ocean. And yeah. they're like, only 8% of these will survive. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And so it's, it's that type of thing, man. You're like literally like, <clears throat> oh, crap. Oh, it's been nice knowing you fellas. And you move on with your yeah. life. Yep. Ah, so, damn it. A mosquito bit me. See ya. Yeah. <laughs> oh, malaria was fun. Okay. So at this point, he moves to Paris. He's working with his father-in-law, doing the watchmaking game, and, you know, made watches. And, and during this time, he also tinkered with mechanical toys. This is kind of pertinent. You'll see why. One day, while in Paris, he stumbled across a magic shop. Okay? And... He just stumbled upon it and didn't even know it existed. And it was in this shop, right, that he started to visit frequently and ended up setting up all these friendships with magicians, both like amateur and professional alike. And it was in this shop that he met Jules de Rover. Who's it? This gentleman, it's I'm trying to I'm probably butchering these names, and I'm so sorry, but it's um Jules de Rover. It was this person who actually coined the term press the digitation. Like, like the it cat wasn't invent a word yet, or he applied it, wasn't it to even a, magic. It wasn't a word yet, bro. Like the cat that was like, I call this pressure digitation, and then it's like, yeah, I know that guy. I know that guy what? that made up that word. Doesn't that blow your mind? It's like how we're like, I'm here to 
magish for you. And then that word exists now. Yeah, that guy was like, that's stupid word. Here's a better one. Yeah. Press the digitation. Oh, that's a sick <laughs> word, bro. That's a sick like, word. Let's how do that. does that how how does that come about? You know? I I'm a, know. I'm about to go and perf- I'm trying to like stumble a word to like make up a new word and it's harder than you think. So that guy really does get. Well, I've been trying to coin the term. Prestige, right. Because prestige was a word, right? Prestige was a word. So like, I'm going to prestige them. But he was like, I'm going to prestige a dictation then. Oh, you're going to prestige people with. Oh, I figured it out. It's you're going to prestige people with your digits, your hands. Press the digitation. Digit. Digitation. As Scott Link is saying, magic of the fingers. What is... <laughs> Hang on, have we just uncovered something? Press the have. digitation. Which translates to digits. magic of the fingers. Wow. So if you're, if you're wowing someone with other things, do you just change that middle part? Dick the press digit... The, press, yeah. I was going to say press the limit, <laughs> limitation, but you went straight oh. for, for the dick. Yeah, I got it all uh, wrong. Scott, he's got some insight for us. Scott Link says, it's Latin. Presto is magic. Digits are the fingers. Prestidig- so is prestidigitation only used for magic? In the I would magic assume sense, so. that word. Well, I don't know. Maybe a masseuse could use that as well, you know? So- masseuse of digitation. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. I've had some people touch my body with them fingers and make me feel real good. And I think that's magical. Moving on. <laughs> Now, during this time working alongside his father, he actually learned many, many tricks to do with mechanical entities, right? And it was from here that he actually built his own mechanical figurines, right? Uh, one was a singing bird, uh, a dancer on a tightrope, and some automatons doing like the cups and balls. Now, his most acclaimed automaton was one of a drawing figure. It was like a little robot that actually did drawings, right? And he displayed this to King Louis III. And then this was eventually sold to P.T. Barnum. So, like, Robert Houdin's influence is quite deep as far as history goes. And when you think about it, he went from watchmaker to, like, automaton maker. Like, imagine having a watch from Robert Houdin. That would be so baller. You could stick your Rolexes up your butthole. I would just be blinging, like, a grandfather clock from my neck like I'm Flavor Flav. But you have that. Now, sadly... On the 19th of October in 1843, um, his wife died at the age of 32, having been ill for several months. At her yeah, death, she was an she was an old woman by then. Yeah, exactly. In, in their 30, standards. <laughs> what does that make me at 39? It makes me an elder. <laughs> now, at her death, having three young children to take care of, he remarried in August. Christ, October, hang on. November, what what's the timeline? Yeah, from October to <laughs> August. Uh, that's like what's that august 8 uh in like in less than a year um he remarried to a woman who was 10 years younger and then she took over the household because that's how things were done back then and he's like well yep great i'll get another 10 years out of this one (laughs) jeez oh jeez it's like buying a toyota it's 10 years old i better get another one okay yeah now it's just like (laughs) Like getting a dog or something, like a pet, like, you know, 10 years. All right. <laughs> now, Robert Houdin loved to watch big magic shows that came to Paris. And he dreamed about opening his own someday in his own theater. But in the meantime, he was hired by a friend, uh, Count de, uh, I pronounced this so many times before, um, Escalopier. We're going to call him the Count, uh, who hired him for private parties. Now, as he had a little more free time, he started to construct his own equipment for his own use, right? For his own shows and and selling it. Now, from that income through the shop, he raised enough money to start making new tricks and um, and and basically funding his own dreams. But here's where it gets super exciting, okay? Because it was the count who fronted him fifteen hundred francs, fifteen thousand francs, rather. Sorry for him to start putting that towards his dream okay now in this theater that he actually ended up buying he went all out with gold trim and tasteful drapes and the whole thing and this is why he's kind of said to be the father of modern magic because it was him who decided from 
the original folks who used to perform at fairs looking like wizards, it was Robert Houdin who was who said that I'm going to wear a tux and I'm going to stand on stage and I'm going to look like the affluent. And it's because of this cat that we get to wear tux and tails. Like he was the first cat to do that. <laughs> Isn't that nuts? So that, that's 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 uh, it's crazy how much has pivoted, like how much of what we do, hey stop it, how much mm. of what we do is from stemming from him, right? Yeah, like the fact that you know everyone was like performing in the street and sort of seen as card hustlers or jugglers or clowns and he has evolved it into this crazy um prestigitation you know yeah way he's of taken life from it, that yeah he's made it a very serious entity from it being like a clown show or anything of that nature you know what i mean which could be frowned upon to some degree by the more affluent people um you know he's gone and said like no this is a classy bit bit of kit you know and it's because of him that we have people like the fred capsules of the world and so forth you know like it's mm. we have a lot to thank for him you know and then we've gone and put on our hats backwards and do street shows um yeah, we're trying to take know? it backwards we're trying to yeah. get it backwards you know um, gotta know where you came from to know where you're going now i want to yeah that's right <laughs> I, was, I was gonna dive down the route of yeah i'm gonna have eight kids and five of them don't <laughs> You know, it's, uh, I won't go that way because Have someone I made a good point. If, if, if he was living now and he had five kids die, you know, his wife dies, like he's remarried pretty soon. He would, uh, oh, come on. Don't tell me you're not going to play the sound now. Well, that, you know, that, oh, hang on. Yeah. Oh, come well, on. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> He, he would be, basically, he would be a main suspect in an uh, episode of Law and Order. With, you mm. know, with his, yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, he probably just breeds kids and then, like, makes them vanish in a box or something like that. And then it would be this whole episode. Yeah. But I, I, here's the thing. Yeah. Okay. So, but here, here's the thing. It was him taking it and elevating it, which I love. And I think that if we all thought like this, it would be absolutely amazing. So, here's the thing about regardless of him trying to elevate it. On the 3rd of July in 1845, he premiered his show in this 200-seat theater. Okay, His show was called the Soiree Fantastiques. Mm. Now, no critics actually covered the debut, right? And most of what we learn about Robert Houdin is from his memoirs, okay? Now, in his memoirs, he said the show was a disaster. And he said it was a disaster because he suffered from stage fright. And it caused him to talk really, really fast and in monotone. At the first show, he was so nervous he had a breakdown. And back then, stage fright will kill you. Yeah. Now, at this point, just so you guys are aware, he's 40. Wow. That's like half of Doug's age. Yeah. So <laughs> think about this, man. Like This cat has just loved the game been an amateur, done a couple of things, and now gone, I'm going to do this at the ripe age of 40. Considering mm. that people were dropping dead in their mid-30s, that's sick. That is so, like, amazing, right? Yeah, the peak so, of the peak of his uh, magical youth, I guess you'd say. Yeah. At 40, yeah. Yeah, and, and this is going to be super important in, in a little bit, and I'll tell you guys why, because... As time went on, he worked really hard at it. He gained a lot of confidence and he started to do his job really, really well. Okay. Now with each performance, Robert Hedan got better and then began to receive critical acclaim. Okay. The following year, he started adding his original tricks to his repertoire and then he became extremely popular. Now there is so many tricks to make mention. Okay. We're already halfway through the pod so far, but I will talk about the ones that absolutely crushed. Now, the first one I want to make mention is Second Sight. Okay, it was a two-person mind reading act. Uh, it was conducting a silly story about how he and his son Emil um, had created a game um, of hot and cold, which resulted in this being used for stage. Now, in Robert Houdin's version of this, he walked onto, he walked into the audience and touched items that the audience held up. His son, who was blindfolded, described each thing that he would touch in full detail. So you walk through an audience, someone's holding up their, their phone, as you would in the 1800s, and he just holds it up 
and he's like, oh, you're holding a phone and it's this color and it looks like this. You're holding a handkerchief. It's this color and away you go. Now, mm. eventually, Robert Houdin changed the method. So instead of asking his son, what's in my hands, he simply rang a bell. And that really blew the minds of anyone who thought that they were talking in spoken code. Mm. He would even set the bell off to the side and remain silent. And his son would describe every object in full detail that was being held in his father's hands. Did he did he um, ever write up his method for that? Like, is that a known, or is it I, something to do with his his uh, crazy um, or, autonomous building abilities? Do you think? Well, it's it's interesting, right? Because or were they all thing, stooges? Well, well, here's the thing. He went and improved it even further, right? And he made it even more difficult. And he did a method where this is, I'm going to read this verbatim. And this is what it says. It says, he placed a glass of water into his son's hands. And then Emil proceeded to drink from it. He was able to perceive the taste of liquids that a spectator from the audience was merely thinking of. Hmm? Wait, say that again? Yeah. He was so, able to... So imagine this. He puts a glass of water in, like he gives his son a glass of water. Right. Son has a drink, right? While you were thinking of a of a drink, you're just thinking of it, right? And he okay. can taste he can taste what you're thinking of. Ah, uh, right, 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 right. Man, you wouldn't want to pick the wrong person who's thinking of whatever they want to drink, and it's like, ah, oh, <laughs> a bunch of fairies, like a bunch of fairy folks, come in with their like dog masks on and stuff, and it's like, oh, this tastes like this uh, tastes like pee. <clears throat> yeah yeah why did oh no yeah that's not good okay but oh, oh, okay. imagine this imagine so this oh this, this is so great all right, let's role play are you ready like phone rings bring bring your your robert houdan okay bring bring uh, hello robert uh it's your agent nick k here how are you buddy i i am good yes good good yes, listen yes, yeah. I, I got a gig for you. I got to check your availability. Um, it's for uh, the Golden Shower um, convention, and they want you to do the second sight test with the water drinking stuff. The water drinking at the Golden Shower? Yeah, you know, yeah, it's at the Golden uh. Shower convention, and they want to do. They, they really want you to do the routine where they think of a liquid and you can taste it. Oh, but I am so sick of tasting things that smell like floor disinfectant. They're not going to think of floor disinfectant. They're going to think of other things, golden things. Yes, but that's exactly what that smells like. No, 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 no. You're, you're thinking how much of, they uh, pay? How much are they paying? Uh, fifteen thousand francs. That's a lot of francs. That's so what many will francs. I do a lot, all of them. Uh, you probably want to get some chewing gum. I will have to start a blog. small town with 15,000 francs. Do they have any females? Uh, yeah. And they all like to eat. Uh, yeah, it's going to be great. We'll make sure there's a meal for you as well. Uh, they're going to be serving a lot of asparagus. So, mm. Well, yeah. I, look, can they, can they throw in a wife? Because mine only has two years left on her mileage. Absolutely. Yes. Um, would you like next year's model or this year's model? I would always like the latest and greatest. Wonderful. All right. We'll oh, cut the hang on one here. second. Oh, oh, oh. Yep. Another, another one of my kids just died. That's okay. Oh, that's a shame. You can make a new one. That's fine. Okay. Thanks for, the, thanks for your time, mate. I'm going to lock you in. Um, yep. 1,500 francs. Uh, we pre-ordered next year's wife. Enjoy drinking piss. Goodbye. Okay. Au revoir. <laughs> <laughs> That's so messed up. Now that's probably how. No, I was trying to think of what. It's not floor <laughs> disinfectant. What is it that? Uh, ammonia. Has, it smells of ammonia, doesn't it? Ammonia. Yeah, but th there's another. What's the thing? The chemical that you chlorine. That's it. Chlorine. Chlorine, chlorine. chlorine smells of bleach. Know. Bleach. Re that's what I was trying to think. Why couldn't my brain think of bleach? Probably because maybe bleach wasn't invented back then. You know, I didn't want to go. I'm not going to say it on this podcast because it doesn't need to be said. But Scotty P 
you know, kind of said it pretty well. But that's what I was like. I'm sure Bleach, uh, yeah, it would be so funny, but I couldn't fucking think of it. But that's because, you know. Oh, my God. Yeah. I'm in the There's 1800s. an IBS convention coming up. They want you to think of a particular liquid. What kind of liquid? Yeah. And that's why I was, I, I should have said, <laughs> I, that, and that's why in that moment I was trying to say, ah, oh, but I'm so sick of tasting Bleach. That's, that was meant to be the, the joke. But anyway. All right, All so right. got this, yeah. So okay, cool. so he started getting booked for this act, for his second sight act. His well, well, people, sight act. But this, no, this is in his own theater. So people are traveling from afar to see this. Now, here's the thing. He was actually so good at this, right? The audiences <clears throat> would do everything they could to try and screw them up. They would bring in mm. really odd tools. They would bring in books written in Greek and other languages to try and throw people off. One time, they brought in a thread counter like a proper threat count that you would use for like, yeah. And every single time the boy nailed it. You know, what would have really stumped them is if they'd brought in an Arctic cooling vest, they would have had no idea. <laughs> Imagine he nailed that. That'd have been so sick. All right. You're drinking. What, what, what liquid am I thinking of? Um, you were thinking of um, a Turkish coffee. Wow. That's, what, that's what it tastes like. Yeah. Yeah. Book, it, book, book him. Book. Now, another one of his amazing tricks that I would like to explore with you guys is the marvelous orange tree. <laughs> this trick was likely inspired by the Indian mango tree trick, uh, where a performer would grow a tree from a seed that would then sprout into a tree and bear fruit. Okay. Um, one of uh, so I'm, I'm, here's how he did it. Okay, it's pretty gnarly. It's quite a large routine. Um, on one of Robert Houdin's side tables, he had an egg, a lemon, and an orange. He went into the audience and borrowed a lady's handkerchief, which was the style then. He rolled it into a ball. He rubbed the ball between his hands, and the handkerchief got smaller and smaller and smaller until it eventually disappeared. Passing through to the egg on the table. Carefully, he picked up the egg. The audience expected him to crack it open and produce a spectator's handkerchief. Instead, he made that disappear. He told the audience that the egg went into the lemon. This was repeated with the lemon and the orange. When he made, a, so he basically just took each item and banished it, right? But when it took time for the orange to disappear, he vanished it, and all that was left was this really fine powder. The powder was then placed into a silver vial. He soaked it with, with alcohol and then set it on fire. He did a lot of stuff with, with ether. I'll, I'll touch about that in a sec. Um, so then a small orange tree was planted in a wooded box. It was then brought forth by one of his assistants. The assistant noticed that the tree was barren with no blossoms or fruit. The blue flame for the vial was placed underneath it and the vapors then caused the leaves to start to spread and sprout orange blossoms from it. Robert Houdin then picked up his wand and waved over it and flowers disappeared and then the oranges blew forth, okay? He was plucking the oranges from the tree and tossing them into the audience to prove they were real. He did this until there was only one left he took the orange weighed his wand over it and the orange split into four sections revealing a white material of sorts inside then two clockwork butterflies appeared from behind the tree and the butterflies grabbed each corner of the white cloth spread it open revealing the spectator's handkerchief now this is probably more synonymous you might have seen something of this nature obviously um if you've ever seen The Illusionist, the 2006 movie starring Edward Norton, this was basically one of the entities that, that was shown in that movie. So he was the guy. How crazy is that? Seeing that back then, seeing that now would be crazy, but seeing, seeing it back then now. would be like, Jesus has returned, you know, seeing it back then. And I wonder, because you know how, and this might not be common knowledge for everyone, but David Copperfield has a private museum of all the like world's craziest collections of, of magic effects. Like he's got all of Houdini's stuff and 
and um, everything. And uh, I know that he has an orange tree, a mechanical orange tree in that museum. Yeah. And um, because one of our friends uh, got to have this personal tour. So basically it's like hidden in Vegas, but like if you're invited, you get told where it is, these gates open up, you drive down, it's this museum and Copperfield tours you personally through it. Mm. And um, it was described that the one Copperfield has, he'd borrow a ring, it would vanish and then the tree would grow and in the orange was the handkerchief with the ring and um, wow. all mechanical. And I wonder if it's like a variation of actual, like I wonder if it's actually one of Robert Houdin's things. Um, anyway. Yeah. Crazy. But like this, this that was That's, like erroneous. Like he's the pioneer and we like, we can all appreciate that like, we all stand on the shoulders of giants and we all start from, from something. But this is the thing, man, like this was, this was his thing. Like, and obviously with that book that was originally, you know, that he read from, you know, I, I, I did look through it. It's only like a 700 page book. And effectively what it consists of is like scientific type magic tricks where it's all very bar based type of effects that you would see. And it would look very familiar. Um, mm. You know, like you put the coin and the two forks and it balances on a toothpick, etc. Like it was those types of uh, those types of tricks, you know. But like this cat, with his awesome mechanical toy making, watchmaking skills, was able to produce magic of this caliber. Like it is just insane. Yeah, he's he's crazy. Yeah, like one of the other things he did, and I'll touch upon this super quick, is um, he he liked doing things with vapor, like and and you know with the um, setting things on fire. And so what he would do is he, he got an assistant to, um, you know, to, to, he would burn the vapors and he would like basically put it over their, their nose and they would kind of pass out, but they would be holding onto two poles. And then he would do like a, a, a type of, um, um, like a, what do you, you know, the, the broomstick lever, uh, suspension. Yep. That yep. type of thing. Yeah. And then he would like remove one and then and then that person would be like levitating and float. And the idea was that the vapors made them very lightweight and they would sort of float around. And um and it was kind of interesting because when you're burning stuff and you're burning chemicals, like that's that's sort of emanating these alcoholic interesting aromas through the uh through the theater. Like it's quite an experience. He's the man. And imagine if Penguin Magic was around back then. They he would have made so much money getting his effects produced by them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Keeping in mind that back in the day, you wouldn't be able to watch the videos and see how it's done. You just got to read it. Like this is what happens. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. Insane. Now, do you, last... do you think, can you think of a method if you had to create the orange effect? <sighs> I thought about it a bit actually. And, um, Mike Michaels, uh, built an illusion for me. Mike Michaels, an amazing illusion builder in in Vegas. We talked about a method to do this exact trick, um, but in the palm of your hand. So you have your hand, you make it into a fist, you pour a little bit of dirt in there, you plant one single seed into the palm of your hand, and then from your hand, the entire tree blooms from your hand, Damn. bearing the fruit. And he told me about it and i was like when you get it together like reach out to me and i think that he probably shelved it because i oh, then again i've failed to reach out to him over the over the past year or so but i just really like that like how insane would that be to grow an entire orange tree from your hand when we spoke about it, it was like you would have to like it would be good to be able to remove it from your hand and then put it in a pot um mm. but as it's because as it stands theoretically like you would produce it and have to walk off holding like a tree in your left hand being like goodbye everybody as you walk off with a giant tree um, i mean and if it's a if it's a uh if it's a uh marijuana tree <laughs> crowd will love it that's a trick <laughs> and just <laughs> they're real buds and you're just snapping off buds and throwing them into the crowd oh my god that would be insane that's now it's a good ass trick he made a lot of tricks and I just, I only wanted to focus on three for the sake of time, but here is the most important one that's not only did he create, but quite possibly one of the most important tricks that has ever been created. And that trick was the light and heavy chest. 
So Rabbi Hudan brought on a wooden box about a foot wide. And he said that he found a way to protect it from thieves. And he would ask a spectator to lift it, usually a small child. The child would lift it with ease. And then he would bring an adult on stage, an adult male. And that person was not able to lift the box. We actually touched upon this when we talked about the top 10 greatest magic tricks of all time. And this was said to be number one. And we were kind of against yeah. it. And this is what kind of sparked me to look into Robert Houdin and this sort of entity. Now, although it was sort of like, that's not that great a trick. Let me tell you guys why it's quite possibly one of the most important tricks ever made. In 1856, he was asked by um, Louis Napoleon, like Napoleon the guy in the movie right now, like Napoleon the third to help pacify tribes in French Algeria. Okay. There were the Marabouts and the Marabouts um, were, were a tribe, right? And they were controlling people using like false magic and so forth. Okay. Now they advertised to the leaders of this particular rank that, um, like that our strong, our, our magic is real and it's stronger than yours. And Napoleon wanted Robert Houdin to show them that French magic was stronger than the Marabout's magic. And there was a magic throwdown in Algeria, right? Where they did shows twice a week in a theater. He used the light and heavy chest during these performances, but instead of it being presented as a comedy trick, as he did in Paris, he presented a different way. Robert Houdin invited the strongest tribesmen on stage and ask the marabout to pick up the wooden box that was placed on stage, right? He picked it up, you know, and so forth. And then Robert Hedan announced that he was going to, like, he picked up no problem. And then Robert Hedan was like, I'm now going to take your strength and sap the strength from him. So then when he got to lift it again, the chest wouldn't budge. And he tried and he tried and he tried. And it got to the point where he actually tried to rip apart the box because it was so yeah. like embedded onto the ground. But instead he screamed in pain and ran off. And the reason is Robert Hedan had uh, fastened an electrical shock to the handles so that when he was, if anything got to it where he was trying to like destroy the box, the metal handles then gave him a shock and it gave him such a shock that he actually ran down the aisle and ran out of the, like the theater screaming down the street. That would, that would have been such a viral video. <laughs> <laughs> now, after his performances were done, he gave a special presentation for several of the chiefs men in this tribe. And he was invited, um, he was invited to the home. Uh, of, of the head of the tribe in the desert, right? So this is like not in a stage, this is out in the desert. So um, so in Dawn of the Arab Desert, it says here, Robert Houdin was challenged to do a special trick. He obliged by inviting one of the rebels to shoot him with a marked bullet, right? Which he then caught between his teeth. Shoot. Right? So there was this true throwdown. Now, this is the when I read this is from an actual history book. There's been other stories in which it was depicted that they had one tribesman lift it, but then they had a French soldier lift it, and he was like, "Look, our soldiers are stronger than your soldiers. Don't come at us. We'll crush you." There's a few different depictions, and I, I I'm not sure which one's correct. Again, this is back in the 1800s. We're finding even photographs of Rubert Hedan during this time and finding pictures of his particular automatons has been extremely difficult and time consuming, mm. but erroneous of that. This is what a comment that was said by, um, uh, by Napoleon and it says, yeah, a blow was struck, right? Um, henceforth, the interpreters of all those who had dealings with the Arabs received orders to make them understand. And to my pretended miracles, only that were a result of skill inspired by guided art called prestidigi prestidigitation in no way connected with sorcery, right? So he went on to just say, like, it's a trick. But ultimately, erroneous of that, he was rewarded with services by the French government for suppressing a possible rebellion from these guys, from the Algerians. So <clears throat> people these days are... They're seeing it all wrong. They're going to be sending magicians to war. To stop yeah. All the now, fighting. here's the thing. Magicians have been used in several wars. 
I fell down a bit of a rabbit hole and I found a uh, Jasper. Uh, his name, surname escapes me, but it was a UK magician. And I'll tell you what, there is so much information on how magicians have been used in warfare. And we might even touch upon that at some point. Um, and I'll explore that, those particular magicians who did, but we'll see how we go. So well, there, there, there was a magician. Um, my friend Christopher Wayne made a video about this, but he there was a, a spy trained as a magician to mm -hmm. be able to infiltrate and palm keys and things of that nature. Mm. Learned magic skills specifically for the art of war. Well, yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Like even Rocco Solano, who's one of my heroes, you know, he he actually, um, you know, he wanted to learn magic because he wanted to have the skills of like a of a secret agent. That's what he wanted yeah, to do. Like, he does, he wanted, and he does. He wanted to be that next kind of Bond type of cat. But here's the thing: like it was just he was performing for these tribesmen, showing that like I can take your strength. Our French shoulders are stronger. I can catch bullets in my mouth, and that got to the point where it was like. You know what? Let's not mess with these guys. And this guy stopped the war. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. It, and it all goes back, all the way back to that book company that that guy sent the wrong book, book. to Robert Houdin, Robert Houdin. You know, if he had sent him the watchmaking book, yeah. You know, he wouldn't have become a magician we wouldn't be wearing suits you know that war would have happened more people would have died yeah basically the whole world couldn't have ex we'd all be extinct now if it wasn't for this watchmaker company sending the magic book and then, yeah like you, you know what you i'm saying you know what i mean yeah and and uh, you know it just goes to show that sometimes like something that goes wrong or bad that happens could actually be one of the best things that ever happens to you like in anyone else's eyes you might have receive something you didn't want to but just because you didn't want it doesn't mean you didn't need it or it wasn't meant for you like think about that that's right and normally a cream will help clear it up but it was all yeah. meant for a reason and Dwayne andrew maybe this is something else we should be looking up for a further time but he said devant helped create camouflage during world war ii there you go and Damn. there's been so many influences with regards to warfare and so forth like inflatable tanks and inflatable you know, like we'll touch yeah. upon that next time because I want it to be a surprise. I don't want to give away too much, but I have done my diligence and we'll have many more history stories. And more importantly, if you're enjoying this, folks, let us know because we want to bring the history. We want to bring the knowledge to you guys. If you are enjoying the history lessons, I'll bring you more history lessons. Yeah. So it's mostly, it's mostly accurate. Mostly. Well, it's so old. It's very difficult to look stuff up and everyone has their own depictions of it as well. So I'm sharing the best I can. So... And Really, it, it's a shame that Doug wasn't here because having gone to school with Robert Hedan could have really shared some insight on this situation. <laughs> Imagine, Imagine Doug's just being like, Robert was a great guy. He used to share his fruit roll-ups with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just thought of something really dark just then. What's that? I don't know. Do you, it's, it's, it's pretty dark. We, we're we going to wrap up very shortly. Is it too dark? No, it's just like, uh, yeah, I'll just say it. So, you know, five of his kid, kids died, right? And then imagine like an <laughs> investigator just going through the the shed in the back of his house. And they're like, oh, there's a chest here with a lock on it. And they're like, this is, what is this? And like, oh, that's just my heavy chest. <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, it just zaps him. That's it. And then he vanishes him into, uh, <laughs> he cut up an orange, like, hey, what's all these orange trees in the backyard? Don't worry about those. Can I have a bite? Don't do it. He oats up. There's an eyeball in here. What the hell? Um... <laughs> yeah, hold on to these chest handles for a second. <laughs> ah, now, <laughs> Man. look, regardless of all the things that have been achieved in his life, being a father and everything else. Now, here's the thing. He not only captivated audience. He not only captivated audiences, but transformed magic from the mere spectacle into an intellectual and artistic endeavor. And his legacy lives on reminding us the world of enchantment and the line between science and magic is often blurred. And it's thanks to him that we have these like countless contributions from him.
it's a super cool thing. Mm -hmm. Now, in his latest years, Robert Houdin gave his last public performance at the Grand Theater before retiring in his home in Saint Gervais near uh, his native uh, Blois. He wrote several books on the art of magic, including his famous memoirs. And on June 13th, 1871, Jean Eugene Robert Houdin died of pneumonia at the young, young age of 65. And though wow. he established only in 11 years of showbiz, he was only in showbiz for 11 years. Wow. And even though he was only in the game for 11 years, his innovation, repertoire, and showmanship were so influential on the magic we do today that we now call him the father of modern magic. And that's the story of Robert. <laughs> That's pretty crazy, and that's uh, that's some history. So, I wonder why he retired. Like, you know, he well, changed he the course of of everything. Oh, okay, so look, uh, the, I, I try to within the hour we had to talk about. I did synopsize a lot of stuff down. Now there was so many tangents that went from people stealing his material, right? Like. Yeah, which is common. I mean, if you look at the prestige, you know, you hear stories of people stealing material all the time. You know, that's like a, a common theme in that time because it was very common, right? And even just by, but you know, just by word of mouth, you would hear like, "Oh, we hear about a guy who can do this," and then you would just come up with your own method. And it's like, "Well, it was my idea." It's like, "What was your thought?" Is what it was, you know. So there's a few things that happened along the way, and he just got to a point where I guess that I don't know. I guess maybe keeping in mind that like it wasn't until forty that he started doing his thing. And again, like an 11 year career is phenomenal. And I guess life expectancy then was relatively, you know, disproportionate to how long we live now, you know? That's why so, I was so surprised that, you know, to hear he made it to 65, like that's like an amazing lifespan. Yeah. Uh, in the 1800s. Yeah. And, uh, but I just wondered, like, I guess that makes sense, like having, a lot of those things to go through people copying him all the nasty comments on the magic cafe eventually you get sick of hearing all that stuff and you just want to quit but but you know any successful magician doesn't really want to retire right you just want yeah. to keep elevating what you're doing which is why i was surprised that he retired but but uh amazing and yeah we all refer to him as what do you call him <laughs> The godfather of magic. The father of modern magic. Yeah. Right, right. And I know, um, you know, when I saw Steve Cohen's Chamber Magic show in New York, he credits Robert Houdin a lot, like a lot. Yeah. Um, in his show and does some of his effects. And yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. look, it's just, yeah, you know, I, I the reason I wanted to start with Robert Houdin was because I, I'm a big believer that when it comes to any sort of art form or just in life in general, you need to know where you came from to know where you're going. And I figured that if we could just take a little bit of knowledge away from this episode and the little bit of knowledge that I crammed into this one hour period about Robert Houdin, that we would all walk away from this a little smarter for it, a little more inspired from it. And that would give us an opportunity to, to make better magic of our own and hopefully have a better impact on, on the world around us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any descendants, do you think, of Robert Houdin alive today? Well, you mean I like, I a, like his family? Yeah, like three three kids survived, right? Yeah. Like he was alive. I wonder yeah, if they yeah. you know. Well, here's the thing. Do you sometimes wonder, like, do you... Like the whole nepotism type thing where it's like I was a this and he was a that and blah, blah. My father was a butcher, so he was a butcher and another butcher and another butcher. Like, do you think that, like that's when it comes to magic that it should be like that, that we should be propagating our kids to do magic forward. Because I don't know anyone who has kids who does, I mean, other than like Blackstone jr. You know what I mean? Like, mm. I mean, who else propagates that forward? That's a weird thing. Hey, I think any, I mean, I, I, I don't have anything to compare it to, but I just feel like growing up, seeing your parent do this thing, usually doesn't make you want to do it like 
because you usually want to, you know, find your own thing to do. Mm. Um, and so seeing your dad be a magician definitely doesn't, I don't think, make it seem cool. Like, yeah, I'm going to be cool like my dad. I'm 18 years old. Let's go and make a silk vanish. I just don't see that happening. You know, the only yeah. thing I see that being propagated forward in is like the racing world. You know, like in the competitive racing world, like there's always like this family have these horses and they've, mm. you know, they propagate that forward. Car racing, especially in motorsports, you know, there's yeah. like, yeah, you know, like son mm. of like, like, for example, the current world champion Max Verstappen, his father was Jos Verstappen, you know, back in when yeah. I was a kid, he was racing. That seems to propagate pretty forward. And and I don't know if it's because it's embedded okay. enough. I think, I think it's because, you know, that makes a lot of money. So they're probably like, oh, I also want to make a lot of money. Yeah. Um, but it's like the family business. The, exactly. But when it's the arts, well, it's not, a, it's not a given that if you get into magic, you're just going to be uber successful, you know? Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, you know, Copperfield could, uh, you know, have quite the legacy if, if uh, his kid or how many kids one of his kids yeah. you know became well, the yeah. next copperfield scotty Imagine p makes that. a good point there's actors and actresses you know what i mean you know who's oh this is the son of abc and yeah. maybe maybe um songwriters and and uh like guitarists that kind of thing maybe that's mm. you know the music is in the blood a lot more perhaps yeah. i i think what's very difficult is when like you can never outshine Okay, like I mean, like, like let's take someone like, um, like Schumacher, seven-time world champion. His son, like, trying to live up to that level. Like, mm. imagine Copperfield's son trying to live up to that level. You know? Yeah. Like you have to. You have to. I think that all of us, deep down, if we are mentoring, we want our students to surpass us. You know? And how difficult would that be to to surpass you know because like for example like, like with Penn and Teller right like Penn's Penn's daughter's doing shows French shows right yeah yeah so I've like, watched it but yeah yeah it would be so difficult to try and surpass someone who is that great I mean it's not to say that you shouldn't try like you should do it because mm. you love it and not for any other reason that you're trying to surpass everyone but I think deep down when we do have people who teach us I mean like I, we've had Many people teach us over the years and you do get to a point where you outgrow them. And I think that's kind of important, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, Miley Cyrus did that, right? With her dad, because her dad was a famous yeah. country Western yeah. singer. Yeah. B Billy, Billy Ray Cyrus, is that right? Yeah. And then, yeah, now she's uber successful. Um, I mean, a time when it hasn't really worked is like Tom Hanks has a son named Chet Hanks and I'm always seeing him popping up on podcasts and stuff and trying to be his own thing but he always will talk about his dad and stuff yeah. and it and he's he, he's got a bit of a chip on his shoulder when i've seen him interviewed about trying to talk yeah. about how separate and successful like he wants to be as an actor but like no one can help but think oh you're the son of tom hanks yeah you know one um, of the greatest actors in the world yeah. Len lenny kravitz's daughter was catwoman in the batman movie you know, she's doing her acting thing, although he was a, a obviously a musician and, you know, kicked out some absolute bangers on the guitar. But yeah, like, it's just like, how hard would it be to, to be like, I mean, Hendrix, imagine like, mm. you know, and, and then, you know, with his guitar work and then follow up on that, you know what I mean? Like it's, it would be so difficult. Well, I just wondered if, if there was any bloodline, you know, still, still around of Roberto Dan, just cause that would be cool. Like it would just be cool to. To know, my great, like, oh, great, great. that person there, you know. Yeah, yeah like my great, 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 great granddaddy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My great granddaddy. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty cool, man. Yeah. Pretty and really I think cool. that Scotty, Scotty said it pretty well. And he just says, children of successful people may have many advantages, but ultimately they should be free to find their own passions. That's a good final word right there. That's that's pretty good. Well, we're gonna yeah. need a, a separate final word now. 
that that's all happened. But but yeah, as we as we slowly come to a close, what a life he had, right? Like so much so that that we all refer to him now and finding his books and a lot of us a lot of people use his name in the stories of like in their patter of routines that they do um it's it's uh, it's pretty crazy and there's not even like videos of him or or anything like that or interviews no. or or stage show footage but yet we still all refer to this man and talk about him and uh, as one day people will talk about the magic guys and how Nick used to be in a band. <laughs> yeah. All right. I feel like, uh, look, guys, this has been great. I feel like I don't, I don't think I've done a final word for a long time. So I think maybe. Um, Absolutely. I'll, now, I'll again, continue not doing it. No, no, yeah. I think I'll well, <laughs> before we wrap this up. Just, again, thanks for being here to all our listeners and people who tuned in live. If you enjoyed the history stuff and you want to see more in this realm or you want to suggest someone we should be looking at for next month's uh, history mm. lesson, you know, throw some names at us. We'll look into it. Otherwise, I'm going to do what I want to do. And um, But I'm also happy to give you guys what you want and do what you want to do. So don't be shy. Hit us up. We'll give you everything we can to add as much value to your world. Thank you all for listening. Josh, why don't you take it home? <laughs> Whoa, what just happened then? Did it just play? Did the final word play for you just then? Yeah. Because it didn't play It didn't play for me at all. That was super weird. And uh, I apologize. I'm going to try that again. Like it just, everything, I just watched you watching nothing. Um, let me try it again. Here we go. All right, it finally worked. And that is all everything with life. Sometimes it doesn't work out the first time and you just have to go with the flow because especially in magic, no one knows where the ending is leading. You know, I hear magicians talk about, do you have outs for certain tricks that you do? And, you know, every out, you should love every out that you have. It should be an outcome, not a specific out. And um, I think that is the same in life. No one quite knows where you're going as long as you just pretend like you meant to do that and meant to be there. Um, you will look like a success. Thanks for listening. It's time for us to disappear now. Disappear now. But we'll see you again on the next episode of The Magic Guys.